Today, we are going to be answering 10 of our most frequently asked questions. Keep watching and see if any of your concerns are addressed. Hi, I'm Melissa Joseph. I'm a certified speech language pathologist. And I'm Haley McHugh, and I'm a certified speech language pathologist assistant. And we're the Pediatric, Pediatric Speech Pals. Pals. Welcome back. We're so excited to answer some of the burning questions that we personally get as speech therapists. So let's get right into this. <laughs> but first, I think we should address Haley's new look. Oh, good. <laughs> so beautiful. I got some new hair for those of you <laughs> listening. It's been darker for the winter. <laughs> well, I'm now no longer a blonde. Mm -hmm. Back to brunette. Mm -hmm. I guess back to my roots. I think it looks great. Do you think so? Yeah. I'm so nervous about it. Every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh my God, who is that person? <laughs> I'm like taken back by it every single time. Yeah. But it should be fun. My parents are Changes happy. <laughs> yeah, your eyes pop. It's oh, pretty. Thank you. Very, very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering what it looks like, you should watch the YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Come check out her new hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, so cute. Thank so you. Cute. Very uh, cute. Well, should we get into this? Let's yes. answer these questions. Yes, we should. Um, okay, so the first question we have is, how do I know if my child is speech delayed? And this is a good question. I get it a lot. Um, it's also an important question because... You know, I feel like we have a lot of parents out there who are wondering, should I take my kid in? Should I not take my kid in? You know, you hear all these like anomalies of yeah. children who wait till they're three and then suddenly they start speaking, um, which again, I would say <laughs> is an anomaly. It's not something that I um, would recommend like the wait and see approach. I wouldn't um, recommend that, but Typically, if your child, I would say, and you obviously pipe in if you have yeah. another. I mean, I agree with what you're saying. So far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that if your child is not saying spontaneously around 50 words by two or is not putting two words together by two, um, come and... I would go Get seek evaluation. Help. Yeah. I would go, I would ask your pediatrician. I definitely would ask your pediatrician first. They always can refer you out to, you know, places that are around your area or they sometimes have those good, like bigger, you know, milestone targets if you have some questions. Um, but I definitely would seek some help if your child by two is definitely not having 50 words. Yeah. I would even or say. Or like any words by 24 to 30 months. Oh, definitely. Once you get to like that range and they're still not saying any words, I would say really, really, really think about going to get it. Um, yes. I would even just push it back to like by 18 months if your child is isn't like saying anything, saying nothing, not signing anything. Yeah. Not, like no communication is coming out. Yes. Yeah. Then I would definitely go seek help. I yeah. mean, you definitely want to, even if your child is not saying mama, dada by, or at least mama, either of those by or 18 months. Word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely would go seek some help. And this is another thing, too, where um, kind of follow your intuition. Um, a lot of parents, I feel like, sometimes know that they probably need um, to get yeah. more support, but don't do it because they want to hang on to the fact that, you know, Sally's neighbor's <laughs> cousin, you know,'s kid started speaking at three um, without any assistance. So just oh, yeah. be mindful of that, I would say. But that, that's what I would say. I agree. I, and honestly, I, like we said, you know, just ask. It's a simple ask. I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah, like Melissa said at the beginning of this, like don't think that your child's an anomaly. Like there are those outliers with literally anything. But mm -hmm. just if you have any concern or a small like feeling in your gut that, well, maybe my child should be saying something, then I'd go ask. Yeah, just because, you know, maybe your kid does start speaking at three, but maybe they won't and most likely they won't and then unfortunately from there some other you know once they start preschool not able to communicate you see more behaviors you see more you know developmentally academically um just a lot of more yes. skills that are just not like formed um so yeah just kind of look out for that yeah, I think that leads perfectly into our next question of, should I be concerned if my child doesn't talk as much as their playmate? I get this all the time. Good even question. Yes. <laughs> and I also get it even in reference to siblings, you know, like, oh, yeah. oh, my firstborn was talking by this many months and my second is not talking at all mm -hmm. or they're much more delayed. Well, first, we highly recommend don't compare. Don't compare your yeah. child, especially your own children. Don't compare them. Don't compare them to playmates, whatever it may be. Just because everybody's different. 
and everyone, you know, hits different milestones or does certain things at different times. And that's literally true for all of life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But especially when it comes to kids and speaking, um, it definitely varies. And there is definitely no general typical child, like no typical, like, oh, this is exactly what this needs to be Yeah, type thing. Yeah. And I feel like it's kind of comparing, um, you know, in every situation, like sometimes a kid basically comes out saying so many words and you know they are compared to a kiddo who has been you know needing support and so you know we're helping them and comparing to a kiddo who has already had all this language and all this time to grow their language it's just it's um becomes unfair and I you know we don't want parents to start thinking they're so far behind even though they're still within now they're milestones yeah like the milestones are great I think that the milestones give you a good marker of like a general idea of where your child should be around that age but I wouldn't be so concerned if your child isn't hitting it right at that time period you know like oh my god my child is this many months and they literally still have zero words it's like okay well maybe they're one you know one month off of that age marker you know that's okay it's it's I mean, it's just a general idea. If you're like six months past Mm -hmm. that age marker and your child is still not hitting that milestone, you know, then you should be a little bit concerned. Yes. Yes. Good point. Um, So on to our next question. How many words should my child have by a certain age? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm, That's a good question. I think that one's really important. (laughs) Yeah. And I think this is um, an important one as far as like what we were talking about earlier, getting an evaluation and following those yes. milestones and things like that. So, um, well, yes. And sorry to cut you off. No, and no. also in reference to like, if you, you know, like in not trying to compare yourself to other playmates and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good point. Um, yeah. So what we have is by 12 months, um, one to five words, 18 months, 10 to 50 words, 24 months, 50 to 300 words, and 36 months, 20, 250 to 1,000 words. It's a lot of words. It is a lot of words. <laughs> yeah. And essentially what happens is you know, they have their base word I mean, the core set, words i guess you can call them and then they start learning the fringe which is like a little bit outside of the base words and they just kind of start growing their language so almost mm-hmm. like snowballs yes. so you know I, i'm sure you know a thousand words <laughs> like it seems like a ton and it is i mean if you yeah. think about it it is a lot it's a lot but um it snowballs so like you know car turns into red car turns into running car driving car mm-hmm. um you know the car is going and then suddenly you've got all these words that are just kind of forming um yeah. just think of it just like the car <laughs> <laughs> it was just about a car mm-hmm. just think of it like floodgates like you know you're getting to the mm-hmm. gate you're getting to the gate you're getting to the gate and then the gate just like flows open and it just floods out yeah once they start learning that words work and they can get their wants and needs met and mm-hmm. you know they just will start saying their words like they'll start using it so that's kind of don't be discouraged if we say you know that by three and your kid's not saying that many words yet it's one it's just the averages of what we would recommend your child to be or to have by this age but also exactly that it's it's um, just an idea like an idea just of where where you should be yeah (laughs) I think that you know I think it adds to the next question like what if my child has words but and someone can't understand them like what what should my child be how understandable should my child be to an unfamiliar listener yes which is important I think this is a big one because as parents and you know caregivers you're pretty much I want to say 90% of the time uh, you understand almost everything your child needs from the start like when your child's a baby you understand what which cry means what you know for what need Mm -hmm. and I think it just evolves and so I think it's also good to make sure like, oh, others. you know, can others understand my child? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? In preschool, can their preschool teacher understand them? Yes. Can their other students understand them as far as socially? Um, just other factors to know when mm-hmm. intelligibility comes into play. Yes, exactly. So overall, well, you just want your child to be set up for the best success if you are not to be by their side. So some research we've done um the old norms referred to in 1980 were by two years old, your child should be 50% intelligible, by three, 75%, and by four, 100% intelligible. But updated from 2021, because there's ever a never ending research done in our field, which is a good thing, but by four, your child should be 50% intelligible, by five, 75%, and seven, 90%. 
Um, <laughs> yes. Which, I mean, I'm very shocked when I read this. I was like, oh. I saw these new numbers too, and I was like, that seems high. That seems like an an age that is higher than I would expect. Yeah, you know, see, I mean, I guess it's good because I guess it gives you know the four year olds little. They are little. Yeah. They are very little. But and to be fair, the old norms were based off of parents. Yeah. So if what they understood and the new norms are based off of unfamiliar. So like you know the grocery clerk, the you know random person who doesn't see your kid every day. Yeah. So that does all also put in some variation. Um, I guess it answers like but, the question of like how un- intelligible should my child be to an unfamiliar listener. Mm-hmm. That's important. I mm-hmm. guess it does answer because if you got parent report, then that is that's not an unfamiliar listener. But I mean, I I mean, I would I would say that you know research is done and it's important, but maybe somewhere in the middle. <laughs> that's kind of what I I would say. You know, know both of these. I mean, you don't have to like know both of these, yeah. but just like you know, refer back to both of these, and if it's in you know, in that range, Mm -hmm. then, you know, we are good. If you feel like it's impacting, I would say if you honestly feel like it's impacting, like by seven, if people aren't understanding him and he's not able, or her, (laughs) if they're not able to communicate their wants and needs because they're hard to be, you know, they're just hard to understand, then I would say it starts to become a problem. So if you're feeling like, oh, there's a problem going on, but the norms say 90% by seven, it's like, mm, base it off of, What's you know, happening. Exactly. And think about like by seven years of age, your child is more than likely in first, second grade, you know, in between those grades. And those are grade school kids. Like they're not in kindergarten anymore or preschool. You know, mm-hmm. these are times where they're going to be really applying their language throughout almost their entire day, whether that be at research in recess, class, you know, answering questions, raising your hand, asking them, helping other peers with things. So just and like by ninety percent, they should be having. Or I'm sorry, by seven, they should be having most of like all their speech. Oh so. yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah. So I don't understand where where the numbers came. From. I mean, if they say, I mean, times have changed. I mean, last year, no one could have expected what we all went exactly. through. So exactly. <laughs> those numbers are different now, and the kids have been impacted in ways that very unimaginable. So yes, that's true. Yeah. So I guess you take that into account as well. But like Melissa said, like. Take a general idea of it, you know, like if you're, I mean, I don't need to repeat it again, but like, (laughs) you know, make sure your child is set up for success. Like Mm -hmm. you don't want to, you know, throw your kid out into the wild and then be eaten alive, essentially. You know, kids are brutal, but so you want them to be just as successful as the next kid. And understood. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So that kind of, again, with the milestones uh, leads us into our next question, which is when should my child be putting two words together? Um, So we kind of hinted on this one a little bit earlier, Mm -hmm. but um, we'll go into a little bit more of like when your child should be putting certain words together. Um, So I like to say, I don't know if you do this too, but I like to say the one word by one, one to two words by one, two to two, three. Two to three words by two, (laughs) three to four words by three, and four to five words by four. So that's kind of why I say, and then obviously, ongoing, it can like vary because the floodgates open. (laughs) So there's, you know, you get a lot more words. Things are different. And I think that's easy for, you know, parents and others Mm -hmm. to understand, like, oh, you know, the age. It's just an easier way than being like, what was that percentage again? You know, it's like one to one, two to two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. it just gives you it. Again, as we can't emphasize enough, it's just a general idea of, like, where your child should be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so this leads into our sixth question as what actually counts as a word? So I think this is a great question. It's a great question. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> it's a very, really great question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Parents might think, you know, certain words, I mean, are real words, but mm-hmm. uh, maybe not. So but what it counts. It does. Certain words count when, you know, you think they don't. And yeah. then you kind of, like... Well, you can go in it. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially what counts as a real word is if it's intentional, independent, and consistent. So mm-hmm. does your child use the word um, intentionally? So they use the same word every single time? Or that's, I guess, leads With to intent. Kids. Yeah, with intent. So they are asking for they want it. Do they do it consistently? How many times do they do it? Do they do it every single time? And if they do it independently. So they you aren't required a prompt for it or like you to be like, oh, do you want, like, is this water? Say water. Mm-hmm. Say you want water. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, they do it by themselves. Like, you know, they point to the water, they say water, and they say it every single time they want water type thing. So that counts as a real word. I mean, and that could be, for instance, I wouldn't say water, but 
but if you were to simplify it, it'd be like Wawa, you know, if yeah. they say Wawa every time and it's the same thing every single time and no matter where they go, you would, they would still say it. Yeah. And that's another thing that I get is some parents think that the word has to be car if it's car. I don't know why I keep coming back <laughs> to car today. Um, the, the, the word has to be water yeah. <laughs> if yeah. it's water. Um, but it doesn't have to sound like water all the time. It can be wa. It can be wah wah. It yeah. can be any sort of um, approximation. It can be a sign. Mm-hmm. It can be just you know, an animal sound, it could be an environmental sound. It can yeah. be anything that has those three things consistent, independent, and intentional. So, yeah. um, or exclamatory words, you know, those that's type of things. We would count. Yeah. yeah, those count as real words. Mm-hmm. So, like being like, oh no, or ah, those are exclamatory words. Those count as yeah. real words. I mean, we, we. Use, yeah, we use those. I mean, I use them all the time. Oh, right? totally. I'm like, oh man, oh, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Those are real words. I, Mm-hmm. I would consider those in my vocabulary. Yeah, so we give we give credit to your kiddo for saying those words, and they are real words. So yeah. it's so fair. don't force water; <laughs> it's not going to get it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the man. full like you know the entire easily, word. Yeah, easily. I mean, obviously, over time you want them to get that word, but yeah, when you're starting, and they will. Out. But they're learning. Yeah, give them some leeway. <laughs> so the next question is: When is stuttering typical? And when should I be concerned? Yeah, that's a good one. So um, the thing with disfluencies and stuttering is that it can be pretty common when they're little. Um, so because this happens, so if they're like one, one and a half to like five years of age, it can come in and out and, you know, certain things happen in their environment, certain new words they're learning, language they're learning, um, excited, things like that. You can see some more disfluent speech. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we get it. I get it all mm-hmm. the time. I Sometimes I get, it, we'll refer to it as tripped up. I get tripped up on my words or, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just common. Those things are common throughout a lot of ages. Yeah. Which, it, which you know, makes this a common question too is because so many people are like, oh my gosh, my, my kid's stuttering. Is this going to, is this going to stay? Is this yeah. happening? Is this things like that? So, um, that's typically, you know, if, if it happens after five, that's a little less common. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that could be an indication that it, it could be, you know. Yes. And sometimes kids who like have early language bursts, as they get older, they tend to get tripped up on their words a little bit. And it's just a little bit hard. It's just because what like their body is trying to catch up with the knowledge that they have. And it's very, I get asked that all the time. My daughter has so many words. She's speaking, speaking. Now she's just can't get the sentence out all the way. It takes her, you know, she has to say the same word over and over. It's like, well, her little brain's trying to catch up Mm because she has so much to say at one moment. Well, that's okay. That's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like if your child repeats syllables or the word once or twice, things like that, then that's, that's okay. Um, usually the signs are monosyllabic whole word repetition. So like, why, 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 why did he go there? Um, part word or sound syllable repetition, repetition. Look at the b- b- boy uh, prolongations of the consonants. So like s- sometimes we stay home um, blocking. So if there's any like blocking, like sometimes there will be a facial, mm-hmm. um, you know, component too, or like a, <laughs> I yeah, want like to a go to the store stopping sort of like they just can't continue their words. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like physical tension. Yeah, I was just gonna say it usually comes with like a physical attribute mm-hmm. too. Like it's like a secondary behavior. Yes. Yeah. If your child is like, you know, I don't want to say the word, but like mouth groping or something like, you know, you'd have to refer to YouTube to see exactly what I'm doing with my mouth. But you know, <laughs> like I'm, you know, extending my jaw and it's kind of just stuck there mm-hmm. before I can get the rest of the word out. Mm-hmm. It's just um, like a pause yeah. and. You know, they learn some strategies. So sometimes the kid will like not say a certain word because they can't say it or they always stutter on the certain word or are just fluent on that word. Mm-hmm. Um, or say, cert- you know, they learn compensatory strategies to kind of move on. So it can be hard to pick up, but um, that's another thing speech is helpful for is just to kind of help the kiddo, you know, realize it's okay if yes. you are a person who stutters or have any sort of disfluency um, in your speech and just kind of give them strategies, stuff like that. Exactly. And also, I mean, don't be discouraged. I've actually gotten this question a lot this past year because I've had a lot of kiddos come in 
developing stutters from this past year of the pandemic. I think a mm-hmm. lot of kids were under a lot of stress. I mean, stuttering changes. Changes. Stuttering is like often, you know, can be re- a sign of stress or, you know, anxiety, all those type of things. And he's, I mean, we all went through it, every, uh, all of us. I mean, and kids got it bad. So yeah. don't be discouraged if your child is now stuttering and they weren't before. I mean, this way we have speech and they can come and get help. I mean, they went through a lot and mm-hmm. they might not, you know, be able to tell you like that they have anxiety or that they feel stressed. They might not even know what that means, but yeah. it's shown in their speech. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. And so don't, you know, we can go into this in another episode yeah. of like describing more about stuttering and such, but, um, just if you feel like your child might have it and you're just listening now, <laughs> just be careful. Um, it's okay. Really try not to like say, oh, I'll get you a puppy if you don't <laughs> stutter or things yeah. like that. Like no pressure. That only makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, d- just try to just let it happen. Don't try and interrupt him when he's in the middle of, or she, <laughs> um, I always go to he, I don't know why. Um, but just like, don't try and interrupt him, anything like that. Just let him finish his sentence um, and kind of move on. Yeah. And just, and seek help if you're very help. concerned. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you can ask. I mean, mm-hmm. people ask us. And yeah. I answer. <laughs> yeah. We've got lots of strategies we can help. Yes. So now, also, this is, I get this. I mean, I get all these all the time. But this one, I think, is like one I see the most via social media. You know, all these are out. And these are ever-changing. Like, mm-hmm. every year, these are changing. But it's the speech sounds by age. So, what sounds should my child have at a certain age? And they have good visuals online. Like, you can look them up um, just on Google, honestly, okay. in, like, Google Images. And they have, like, good, like, visuals that has, like, a literal two in it. And then all the, the um, sounds, sounds that you should have by two or three or four. And it, um, it's helpful. It is very helpful. I mean, it helps me. Sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, I have to refer back to, I can't, I mean, there's what, 26 letters, and, but there's lots of sounds. I guess I take that back. Sounds are different than the letter. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm not sure. Or like I said, you know, it's ever changing. It's always mm-hmm. different. So by two, your child should have the sounds P, B, M, D, N, as in Nancy, H, T, K, and G. That is a lot of sounds. <laughs> And I mean, they might not have them all, and they and they might not. They might not get them till three. Honestly, we don't really start focusing on these sounds um, until three, anyways. Like a lot of the assessments we have, don't you don't do any evaluation until three. Mm-hmm. So, um, however, I will start early on some of my. Sorry, I cut you off on the other <laughs> the You're other fine. ages, but I will start early um, and just kind of work on it if it's impacting like people can't understand Mm -hmm. um or just because it's also another thing i just always just yeah as a a therapist (laughs) i'm gonna gonna start earlier rather than later but you know k and g those are tough sounds and i have i know (laughs) yes i know a lot of kiddos who don't have that k and g sound Mm -hmm. and that's fine like they're two Mm -hmm. and i'm like oh you know it's good if they have it if they don't buy you know i'm I'm gonna give them leeway at three and if we're like into three and we're still not getting it all right, then we need to seek some help. They're not stimulable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Stimulable meaning like they aren't able to like produce, produce just it the all. sound by yeah. itself. Yeah. So, well, and then at three, they should have W and G like jumping, like that N sound, F and Y. And then at four, it's L, J, C, H, as in like, ch- like choo choo, S, Z, V, as in like Valerie, and S, H, sh. A quiet sound. <laughs> and then at five, the tricky and the worst one, R. So, <laughs> and I mean, parents will wait lo- like a long time to get this R sound to be mm-hmm. like, oh, well, you know, it's fine. But that R sound is tough. But at five, mm-hmm. they should have that sound. And I, I honestly, I'm going to stick to my guns on that one. As a Do therapist, I'm, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> we, let's fix this R sound now. Because yep. that one, I, I think is we. I it's think, easier to fix when they're younger, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. And then also at five is the voice TH. So like as in there. And then at six is the voiceless TH. So think. So, mm-hmm. you know, voice on, voice off. But um, so those are all the sounds that you should have by the certain ages. I mean, like we keep saying over and over, beat it with a dead horse. But, you know, this is just a general marker. Obviously, mm-hmm. as a therapist, I'm going to have, like I just said, things where I'm like, no, 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 we're going to fix this now. But that's just more of the fact of like, this is just really tough later on and it's harder to fix the late, the longer you wait. 
And I always think about this, you know, as an adult. I'm always like, oh, you know, parents are like, oh, it's fine. You know, our sounds cute. But then I'm like, see an adult with a speech error. And I'm just like, mm. it's harder. And I'm like, oh, that didn't mm-hmm. sound so great. You know, like I was, um, someone was talking about um, adoptive families are coming up, you know, for the holidays. And this uh, adult, he was, you know, talking about it. And he was not saying like L was a W. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, maybe I'm just my ears are just trained a little bit different but I was like oh no like and I just probably you know he could get it fixed but I just think it's better to get those sounds fixed earlier than later and I know a lot of parents are concerned about that you know they don't want them to be bullied or not saying that they would be there could be another reason why they can't make that sound etc oh yes yeah but um it's just something that can be helpful to get you know a speech evaluation and get those sounds in um Mm -hmm. early if you can yes agreed um so the next one we have is, do speech therapists only help with speech? Haley, do we only do speech? No. <laughs> we do so many things. <laughs> we do a lot of things. Yes. Um, we So I guess just to, like, umbrella mm-hmm. what we do. Um, we identify, assess, treat, speech, language, and swallowing disorders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so oh, yeah. we work on fluency, speech production, language, cognition, voice, resonance, feeding, swallowing, oral rehab. So that's like the hearing um, portion. So we do a lot. Um, there's like a, a big um, market for it. We do all ages, literally yes. all ages. Um, specifically, like, do Haley and I do all that? No. No, I know. <laughs> this is the hard part. So you're only going to get, like, you know, our view of, like, our small window of what we do in speech. But pediatrics. Pediatrics. Language. Oh, language. Language, you know, early language learners. Yeah. All that stuff. Mm-hmm. But speech is so much more than that. Mm-hmm. Like, so much more. A lot of fields. Um, oh, you a know, lot of settings. In-home, yeah. cl- clinic. Hospitals. Hospitals. Yep. Um, schools. SNFs, uh, skilled nursing facilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's another thing in grad school, you kind of learn that the basics of mm-hmm. all of them. Um, and then you kind of pick your niche and then you kind of continue to grow that language. But the great thing is it, or not language that learning, Yeah, if you're, that, um, kind of, you, you know, want to move on to a different section, you definitely can, cause it's still within our scope. So you can move on to a different one and just, you know, can continuing education, but, um, that's the best so part. Field. Yeah, that's yeah. the best part about our field is that you literally, I mean, you can't do anything, but you basically could, in a health side world, I guess, mm-hmm. tap into almost anything. You could work alongside, you do SP Any service. population. I, yes. In the hospitals, I mean, speech therapists are like almost always there. Yeah. Whether you know it or not, you might not, even if you've been, you might not even know, but mm-hmm. they're, they're there and it's pretty cool and it's mm-hmm. super awesome. So, so yes, we do speech, but we also do more. We do a lot more. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And for our very last question, we have are some potty training tips. Mm. (laughs) This is just every day. We get asked a lot about potty training, um, which obviously we work in pediatrics, so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, We are not necessarily like – I wouldn't say I wasn't trained in grad school about potty training. Um, I think it's just one of those tips and tricks you kind of pick up as you go. Um, But parents, we – know the you know why behind things and like how we can help you know the skilled strategies things like that that can help so that's why we feel like we might give our tips of what we recommend to parents um you know obviously other people might have different tips and tricks and such like that and feel free to comment below if you have different um, oh yeah please share yeah but um but here are Hours. Yeah, so this is definitely – I worked in behavior before I did speech, and so a lot of times, you know, in behavior, we're working on with families on how to do potty training. So I would say that boys and girls are different when potty training. I'm not saying that, you know, like – every boy and girl are the same and are like all boys are this way and all girls are this way but I do think that they are different I think girls have an easier time going to the bathroom or like becoming potty trained than boys do I have watched it you know and seen it before and I'm not sure why you <laughs> know I can't tell you why boys have a harder time but and it's, it's just very common so don't be discouraged if it, you know you have your firstborn's a daughter and it was like a snap to potty train her and then you have a boy the next time around and you're like, oh, my God, he is scared of his poop. He's not mm-hmm. going poop in or the Or if uh, vice versa. Or if you, yeah, ha- you yeah. know, just any – again, with the comparison, yes. just like – Yeah, don't compare. But each child's different. Then, 
Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, Melissa, too, also found a really good research article from Pampers. So refer to that in the um, description box in our YouTube to Mm -hmm. get some more information on um, potty training. But honestly, potty training is just, you know, trial and error. So I I mean, I recommend doing like the one-to-one. So like, you know, everyone, everyone starts out with like, oh, it's a time schedule, which it should be a time schedule. So like every 20 minutes, you're going to go to the bathroom and then you're going to sit on the potty until they go to the bathroom and, or you can extend it. I mean, it just depends on how frequently your child. Every hour, every. Yeah. Whatever it is. Like some kids don't pee as much as others and some. So or, often. So that's fine. And then it'd be like a one-to-one reward. So it's like they go potty, they get, you know. M&Ms. They get an M M&M, and M, you know, and or I have, and I have kids refer to them like or they're a hug in a clap. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and the guy have kids who refer to their candy favorite candy as the PP candy. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just it's a, in that it helps, and then they're like, okay, I know that every time I'm going to go potty, I'm going to get this M M&M. and M, and it might not even have to be like. I honestly recommend something like a candy or something that they don't really get normally. So like whether you can make like a prize box and go to the dollar store and buy like. A, like a hundred mini erasers and like they only get those little erasers every time they go potty or M&Ms are only when we're going to have to go to the bathroom. So it's something that they look forward to because if you're mm-hmm. going to get M&Ms all the time, then the what's, what's the point in going potty for an M&M if I'm still going to get M&Ms if I do, you know, eat dinner. So, so I would keep that in mind as well. And just, and also an emphasis on like your reaction to going to the bathroom. So your child goes to the bathroom, you are elated. It is literally the best thing in the entire world. You're screaming, you're jumping, you're, you know, like Melissa said, you're hugging, clapping. It's a whole thing. Like we call them potty parties. Like we're having a full on <laughs> party in this bathroom because your child went potty. <laughs> potty party. <laughs> I haven't heard of that. That's cute. So I mean, because you don't want them to be discouraged either, you know, like, oh man, that smelled or like, oh, that fart was stinky. Well, maybe next time they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to fire mom said it was stinky. You know, like maybe make jokes that depends on your household and what it is. But, you know, you're like, yes, you did it. You went potty. You went pee-pee. You went poo-poo. Whatever it is, it is the the highlight of the day. Mm -hmm. And I do that in the clinic too. I mean, I'm always like, we're telling everyone. Like we went potty and I'm like, oh, so-and-so, miss so-and-so, miss this, miss Mm -hmm. Melissa. Like, Mm -hmm. did you see that he went potty? He went pee-pee in the potty. And they're like, what? You did? Or even if they don't actually go. Go, but they tell you they yeah. have to go. Oh, you can. Yeah. Oh, did you tell mommy you, you had to go to the bathroom? Yeah. Good job. Yes. Things like that. Like you, I'll kind of. Pre- oh, oh, yeah. I'll praise him for things like that oh, too. Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, and like bring it up later. Like you know, like mm-hmm. mom's at work all day and dad's been helping with the potty. Like mom comes home from work and dad's like first thing is like, oh my god, Sebastian said he went had to go pee pee in the potty. And mom's like, what? Oh mm-hmm. my gosh! And he's sitting there like. Oh, I forgot that was like five hours ago. I didn't know. And it just is like, okay, I'm going to say it again. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, mom, I have to go potty. And then they're like now more inclined to go try to do that initially or like initiate Mm -hmm. by themselves. So just those things. I mean, and it's tough. I I can't speak for you guys. I'm not parents, but like. I'm not a parent. I should say I'm not parents. <laughs> You're not mom and dad. <laughs> or mom. And mom. Yeah, I'm a mom. I'm, a, I'm one person, but I'm also not a parent. So I can't say, you know, I can't speak for like personal experience, but I do, you know, my clients and stuff and my patients and I do see the struggle it is. And it sometimes is really tolling on parents and yeah. especially like, you know, a lot of schools won't let their children go to school without being potty trained. So like, I know that's hard and it's not fun, but there are lots of things out there and, you know, like we keep saying, like, ask for help too. Like, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure anyone who works with children is going to have a tip or two of how to help your child by train. Not mm-hmm. everyone's the same. Does You know, like I said before, trial and error. So like, yeah. oh, you know, my friend, you know, Melissa suggested that like I do this. I'm like screaming yay at the potty. Oh, that didn't really work for my child. So like maybe I'll try, you know, this instead. Or some kids don't like m&ms or they don't like a treat they'd rather have verbal praise so this is trial and error and you try it and i mean yeah. start when you feel kids kind of start to you know you, there's like a time where you're like oh i think my child's like starting to get ready for it they like send this like i don't know signal there's no like verbal signal but it's there mm-hmm. and another thing you'll kind of know i think you'll kind of know you kind of know you're like my child's kind of getting ready to go potty or like even sometimes it's like, oh. And try not to start too early. Um, yeah. Like if the, that can kind of delay things. So, I mean, t- 
you don't have to be too late either, but just like, you'll know when they're ready. Yes. It seems again, I'm not a parent either, but it seems you'll know when they're ready and, um, you can kind of start the, the tips and tricks. Or even if you don't know, if you're like, well, my child's not sending off this like bat signal that I have to go potty. (laughs) Like you're like, where is it? You know, it's more of like, all right, I'm getting closer to it. Yeah. Like I need to try it or we're getting closer to school age. Like my child has to be potty trained to go to the school. It's really important. So we should try, start trying. And also too, I mean, this is just a small little tip I'm going to throw it in there because parents are always like, well, you know, like there's, we're trying, there's peeing their pants all the time. Well, and it's messy and I don't want to deal with mess. Put on underwear and then put a diaper on over it because diapers like, When kids wear diapers, they don't feel the sensation of the pee. So they don't know that they're peeing or they don't know it's just there. It absorbs in the diaper. So if you put on underwear over the diaper, they're still going to get that sensation that they peed their pants because it's not comfortable and it's not fun. Mm -hmm. But also, it's less messy. Yeah. So that's just a small tip, too, if you were like, oh, well, these, like, the, you know, potty training underwear is, like, not thick enough for my child. Yeah. And I guess we could go into, like, literally a ton of tips. So um, we won't. I mean, we can maybe even do a podcast again about that mm-hmm. specifically if you'd like um just let us know if you have more specific questions or anything like that but yes. um but yeah i mean we'll leave a resource article or a just yeah i guess just a, a link, little resource yeah. link in there um in the box below too if you want to kind of refer to some more specific tips um or just like how to get started things like that um feel free to click on the link yeah for sure <laughs> So if you have any concerns about your child's speech overall and language, um, we recommend that you get an evaluation. I mean, Mm -hmm. go ask some help. If you're like, if any of these questions that we answered today, you're like, oh, my child is not doing that. Or, oh, I was wondering about that. Go get an evaluation. Go ask your pediatrician to refer you out to one or just go to one by yourself. Or, I mean, I'm sure there's someone in your area that will know of a speech therapist or somewhere to get a speech evaluation. So yeah, don't forget. Um, and if your questions weren't answered in any of these 10 questions, um, let us know. You can DM us. You can email us at Pediatric Speech Pals. You can also Facebook message us, too. Um, we have a Facebook page, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, all of our information is um, on our YouTube and our, and our podcast, yeah, actually. So yeah, the all the bio. descriptions. So yes. just reach out to us, and um, we'll get back to you. Yeah, and maybe we'll do some more of these. Mm-hmm. So ask away. We're yeah. more than happy We're, to help. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. We're more than happy to help. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks for listening. We Yay. hope this is helpful. I hope so, too. And we'll see you next week. Bye. If you are ever curious about where we got our research or want to learn more, refer to our YouTube description box where we will leave links to the resources we used. We'd like to thank our producer, David Martinez. If you want more speech tips, don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on our Facebook page, follow us on our Instagram and TikTok at Pediatric Speech Pals. Lastly, if you have any questions or concerns, email us at pediatricspeechpals at gmail.com.